Hey, everybody, this is Mark Levine, and you're listening to the NYC Real Estate Podcast. This is episode 30, and today uh, we have Julie Schechter from Armstrong Teasdale LLP. How are you? Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. So you were on a few weeks ago. I finally dragged you on, but uh, we're doing another- And now another, you can't keep me away. I know. We're doing another COVID episode. Everybody was very um, positive on your, your last performance on our, oh, great. our Glad podcast. Oh, great. Glad to hear it. So I figured, why not bring you back and hopefully get some return, you know, visitors that are following. All right, let's hope. So before we get in, I just wanted to remind everybody that you can write the show at nycrealestatepodcast at gmail.com. And we're trying to put these out uh, basically weekly. So we've got a lot of information. A lot of the the past month or two or three has been a lot of COVID, you know, information. And this isn't going to be any different. But I think Julie and I were talking offline. And now that we're seeing the slide back into a little bit more normalcy with the different phases throughout New York City and how that will um, react in buildings and what we can do. So Julie, you're an attorney. Your firm has drafted up a a pretty good guideline for- Thanks. uh, You're welcome. For different rules and considerations for a bunch of different items. So I thought that uh, in talking with you that it would be a good idea to kind of go through that as we kind of ramp up and be cautious. But Also, you know, getting back to some sort of normalcy while keeping everybody as safe and healthy as we can. Um, So I will turn over to you if you uh, just, for those people that haven't heard the podcast before or don't know you, do you want to give your two minute background on uh, what your firm does, what you do and what you specialize in? Sure. So as Mark said, I'm a partner at Armstrong Teasdale. Uh, We have one of the largest co-op and condo practices in the city. We represent hundreds of cooperative and condominium boards um, in all areas of concern. And uh, the hottest topic for our boards recently has been COVID protocols, how to keep it out of the building, what to do if somebody gets it. Um, And so we've been devoting a lot of our time to keeping our clients informed about the best practices uh, in these unprecedented times, which is ever-changing and, and not easy, but I think we've done a pretty good job of nailing down some, some solid policies and protocols for our board. So that's what Mark and I are going to discuss with you today. Um, and feel free to shoot us an email if you have any questions. And a little known fact is we actually last year, and I don't know if it'll be this year again, but at the CNYC show in November, we were two of the three teachers in a, uh, a resident communication class. So Uh, The Council for New York Co-op and Condo is a great organization. I think it's cnyc.com, maybe. But if you do a search, yeah, if you do a search for the Council of New York Co-op and Condo, they have a great um, symposium essentially in November and they teach classes. I have a feeling this year is out of consideration for us, but I think next year probably we'll we'll do it again if they invite us back. Um, All right, so let's start with, Um, access into the building and the rules that you think are good for buildings to follow in terms of the common areas, who should be allowed in, what precautions we can take? Um, Well, um, most of our buildings had entirely restricted access during the shelter in place period um, and prevented outsiders from coming into the building. And the thought process at that time was the the fewer people in the building, the less likely someone is to bring in an infection. Um, At the time, I think that was the appropriate decision, but I think as the shelter in place restrictions lighten and the requirements for commute, you know, uh, or people getting together in groups um, less than 10, and we intend that to um, be increased over time, that the restrictions need to reflect um, the new rules. So um, what we've recommended to our boards is um, having hand sanitizer available at the entrance to our buildings and encourage people coming in and out to use those Um, Some of the restrictions on who was allowed to enter the buildings during the height of the COVID period, we had restricted um, nannies and housekeepers um, for all non-essential workers. We had um, restricted real estate brokers who were showing apartments. That was part of the governor's executive order that um, showings were to be virtually only and not in person. Um, We had restricted alterations, which was also part of an executive order on a moratorium on construction. 
Um, but Except for essential, right? I mean, right, not essential that's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, I was referring to, um, you know, kitchen replacements, bathroom, renovations yeah. of apartments that are considered non-essential. But yeah. at this point, as time goes on and the um, infection is sort of contained, it's important to um, reopen the buildings, but do it in a way that is still safe, um, but allows business to go on as usual. Um, one thing that's important to note is that there is an executive order that face coverings have to be worn in, in all uh, public places. And right. we believe that includes common areas of the buildings. Um, there Especially is when you can't, you can't social distance. Well, you that's know, even, right. Yeah, because um, most of the, the hallways are going to be narrower than six or seven feet. The laundry room, you've got multiple people and hopefully not. Um, and the elevator too. So what we've done separate from also your guidance is putting out a memo that one family or one person, if you're not in the same family living in the same place, can be in the elevator at one time, limiting, yes. it, you know, on the laundry room. I think we discussed it on the last podcast too, like limiting it to one also person or family in the laundry room at a time. And a lot of the laundry services now have apps so you could see which laundry machines are open, you know, so that you're not going down if it is. Or if you're apps. old school, you could do a sign up sheet in the front of the laundry room or in the lobby. Yeah. For those people who don't have apps. Yeah, just bring um, your own pen. That's, you know. That's right. Pen. Bring your own pen. Yeah. Um, yeah, other suggestions for the laundry room in particular were um, to extend the hours. A lot of buildings have limited hours for um, laundry rooms, but we've just extended it to 24 hours in a lot of our buildings or just extended it beyond the nine to five to try to decrease the amount of people in there at any one time. Um, other buildings that we have have flagged certain machines that are separated um, sort of every other machine in order to sort of decrease. It's just so naturally social distance the people who are doing their laundry. We've yeah. had buildings that have done sign up, so you have to reserve a time to be in the laundry room. But definitely a good practice that all, all building laundry rooms should have is that there should be. Um, the wipes available and we should encourage all shareholders or unit owners to wipe the machines after they use them um, and also encourage building staff to the extent that it's available to um, to the best of their ability sanitize and clean the laundry rooms at least once a day to reduce um, any infection that may be there another consideration that we've suggested to some of our boards is if you know that someone is COVID positive, um, in order to encourage them to stay out of the laundry room, which is a heavily trafficked area, um, we've suggested boards consider paying for a laundry service. Um, you know, I think once is appropriate in a two week period, which is a contagious period if a board wants to be generous and do it twice. You know, typically it's a $20 investment, but if it keeps the infected person out of the laundry room and still um, enables them to get clean laundry, it seems like a worthy investment for the board. So that's some, you know, another consideration for boards. And I think a good point of entry uh, product that you could have is if you do have a doorman or a concierge that's at the front door, we have seen all those plexiglass, plexiglass um, dividers pop up. So having something there that could divide the person coming into the building and stopping at the desk and maybe signing in. And then the person that's behind the desk from the frequent interactions. So whether or not that person coming in is wearing a mask, which they should be wearing a mask at all times in a, you know, public area, um, this will help to further protect. And people do wear gloves and gloves they've shown, or I've seen videos on the gloves and it's, you know, it's a, it's almost like a false sense of security, the gloves. That's right. Because you think, oh, I'm protecting myself. But in, in actuality, you could be spreading it a lot more because you, you think you're protecting yourself. You touch you know, items, you, you still touch your face. I think there was some article I read that on average, you touch your face like 25 times an hour, which I totally- Yeah, well, I totally was gonna do. say, when you try not to touch your face is when you realize how many times a day you actually touch your yeah. face, when you're so, consciously trying not to. Yeah, so having all those disinfecting uh, stations whether or not you're wearing gloves is going to help. And, you know, the, probably the worst part, part of the building to touch is it going to be in the elevator because all those buttons are being touched by everybody. So, you know, use something like the back of a pencil, like an eraser or something that, you know, you can not touch with. And there's a lot of things that we could go on and on about. But I think just having some sort of a policy in place, like what you 
kind of outlined is pretty good. Um, well, I think, I think the biggest takeaway from elevators is to just not enter if you see other people in there and just simply to wait for the next one that will um, reduce the close proximity that you are with somebody who's outside of your family. Um, yeah. The other thing is that we failed to mention when we started is although uh, people are required to wear face coverings covering their nose and mouth um, when they're in common areas of the building there is an exception to the rule for people who are medically unable to do that and also for children under two um okay i mean good luck getting a face mask on a child under two i know it's hard enough on my seven-year-old so i can't <laughs> even imagine it you know a two-year-old um, so, we have advised our doormen um, that they they can and that they should deny access to somebody who doesn't have a face mask. Okay. Um, so that's good guidance. And if I know you mentioned the plexiglass, which is definitely um, a safe uh, option for a lot of boards who want to protect the doormen um, from coming in close contact with the residents. But another option is to simply put tape six feet away from the doorman's seat uh right. the booth just to remind people to stay within six feet you know yeah. keep keep six feet distance from the doorman um we've had a lot of buildings just throw down some masking tape and and it seems to be pretty effective we've had a lot of success with that so a lot of people that come into buildings that aren't residents tend to be um staff and staff could be anything from a dog walker it could be a nanny a housekeeper or it could be you know food deliveries are coming in I'm not sure that food delivery is going up to the floor are the best idea. I think a lot of buildings have said, okay, you can leave your food at the desk and somebody will come down instead of having the delivery guy trips up because they're going into a lot of buildings. Exactly. Um, we kind of spoke about this a little bit offline, but I'm of the mindset that you shouldn't restrict the housekeepers and the nannies and the dog walkers as long as everybody can prove that they don't have any symptoms. And if you do temperature checks, if they're temperature checked, because what we were saying before we got on, a lot of these essential workers rely on, that may be in your building, rely on these workers so that they can also go, you know, and go to the hospital, go to the restaurants, wherever they may work. So I think that this is all catering to those essential workers. And as long as you do it in a safe manner and they abide by the rules of the building, I think that it should still be allowed. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's it's very important for essential workers right now who are still in the workforce, but over the, uh, you know, next uh, four, six, eight weeks, we're going to see non-essential workers, hopefully, resuming uh, going to the office. Um, and then, you know, the, the need for dog walkers and nannies and housekeepers is going to become even more important um, in order to get people back into the workforce. So, you know, boards should definitely consider, um, you know, regulations or policies for allowing those people back in. I agree with you that a complete prohibition on allowing them in is is just not a yeah. good call at this time. We have to lighten up on the restrictions. You can ask them to use service elevators. You can deny access if they're not wearing face masks. Um, for dog walkers, you can make the resident bring their dog down to the dog walker so that the dog walker doesn't enter through the building. Um, and same for food deliveries. You could say that the resident has to meet uh, the delivery person out, you know, at the front door right outside of the building to prevent the delivery person from walking through. Um, those are all restrictions that boards may want to consider, um, but that allow the um, you know, people in the building to start to have access to the things that were, you know, prohibited uh, the last couple of weeks. So we've talked about the existing people in the building. I want to get out of the building. I want to sell. I've had enough of New York City. I'm moving to the suburbs, moving to Westchester or Long Island. Um, yeah, you wouldn't be the only one. I hear residential <laughs> houses are making a killing right now. Yeah. Everybody's so it's city. also changing the, the landscape in terms of uh, brokers and showing apartments. I think you mentioned just before that if you wanted to have a, a showing, it was a virtual showing during the stay at home order. So it was literally just the brokers or the salespeople going and taking a video or maybe the owner taking a video and that was how it was shown or FaceTime or however you do it. Um, what are the changes that we're seeing go through? So with the open houses, that is something that you can't control the people coming in and out. So I'm assuming that we're going to say no open houses for now, right? 
Yeah, that was definitely our recommendation to our boards. Open houses, um, you don't know how many people are gonna come. Um, it's over the course of a couple of hours and the last thing you want is for 75 people to show up and all be hoarded into a one bedroom. So um, we're recommending that our boards continue to um, prohibit open houses, but um, to allow brokers to do private showings for um, a limited number of people at any one time. Um, we're recommending that the brokers notify management or the superintendent before they do this. Um, and we're requiring that everybody, again, who enters the building wears an appropriate face mask. And if any of the people who are coming to look at the apartment are not wearing the appropriate face coverings, access can be denied. Um, get like out of with, here. Move yeah, on. Get out. <laughs> But like with um, nannies and dog walkers and food delivery people, um, boards can also require um, outsiders coming to look at an apartment to use a service elevator, which may be a good option. Yeah. Um, and I think just to jump in on what you said, I think giving notice to the management is not just to let us know that you're showing the apartment, but it's also so that we can take the step of disinfecting as soon as that right. showing is over. Um, so that's an important part. That's right. And also another thing that um, we're trying to discourage is loitering in any common area, um, especially the lobby, because it tends to be a communal place for people to hang out. And we're trying to discourage that at this point. And so we're asking brokers to meet um, any of the people that they're going to be giving the showings to just right outside on the sidewalk to prevent the number of people from congregating in the lobby. So that's a simple change. Um, these are all good ways of reducing um, the number of people who enter the building and the amount of time that they spend in the building. Great. Um, at the discretion of the board, you note that a staff member may accompany the broker and his or her clients. And I, I guess I'm more concerned with that in the sense of common areas and amenities that the, bro that the buyer may want to see. You know, oh, I want to see the gym. I want to see the pool. I want to see the roof deck. I want to see the laundry room. But now you've got somebody or a group of up to four people because we've said, okay, you can come in as the broker plus three going into every place. And, and quite honestly, most of those are probably closed right now anyway. So you really can't see it. So um, I would recommend, you know, having the clear path of, okay, you go up to the apartment and you come down and you leave. You know, anything else right. has to and be And to the seen extent online. possible, um, you know, you want to see an apartment that you're about to buy, um, but you don't have to live in the laundry room. So to the extent possible, seeing a photograph of the laundry room is probably sufficient for most buyers. Yeah. And you could always get all of that from previous listings. It's, it's going to be all over the internet on Street Easy That's or right. on the broker's websites. Um, but that also may be a good idea for boards if there are a number of apartments for sale in your building. Maybe you want to take photographs of the common area, um, yeah. you know, the common amenity spaces and send that to the brokers or make them available. Some buildings have websites in yeah. order to prevent traffic to the common areas of the building. I hadn't even thought of that, but that's a great suggestion. It's a, just like a, a little marketing three-page three PDF with pictures. Just Exactly. Brief, yeah. Um, so now we're moving throughout the building and the laundry room, obviously we talked about that. It should be um, limited access to the laundry room. You mentioned that uh, maybe a sign-up sheet would also be good. I mentioned to bring your own pen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hand sanitizer, we're going to keep that in the laundry room. Um, we want people to sanitize as much as possible. We want them to wipe down the machines. We don't want germs lingering. Our staff is also making sure that that's taken care of. Um, you should always... The same thing, wear a mask and, you know, a uh, face covering that covers your mouth and your nose. Uh, if you're within the medical conditions or under two, that obviously doesn't play. But if you have a medical condition or you're under two, I don't see uh, people hanging out in the laundry room too long. If that's the case, you know, it's going to be good. I don't know. Every rooms. building has that one person that likes to hang out that's there. That's true. That's why we take away all the chairs and tables. <laughs> that's right. Them. Um, you mentioned that it's a good idea to maybe extend the hours for those that aren't 24 hours. And I, I, I make that with the caveat that you could have, and I have buildings where there's the laundry room directly next to a shareholder's apartment and the hours are there because the shareholder next door could hear the machines. So it's more of a quality of life issue for that. Yeah, that's an, that's an important consideration. It's a, the laundry rooms don't need to be 24 hours, but the goal was just to extend the hours, you know, within reason, if that's the case, 
just to sort of stagger the amount of people in there at any one time. Yeah. Um, and then, well, for, I mentioned before, for those buildings that have the, um, the app where you can check your wash and do all those things, maybe you can reload your card online, you take full advantage of those. Um, yeah, those buildings are awesome. They are. I'm a big fan of reloading through an app. My building is old school and you still have to go down there with your credit card. We're better than quarters. I was going to say, um, do you have like the best? No, it's an quarters. upgrade since quarters, but you still, no app. You have to go down there with a credit card or no, with cash. Sorry, not even a credit card. Yeah. So what, what's your take on um, fitness facilities? Gym's opening up now. Do you think that it's a good time or do you, do you think that it should wait a little bit? You know, it's funny because of all the amenity spaces in our buildings that we represent, for whatever reason, there seems to be the biggest pushback on gyms. I think it's because people are stuck at home and have too much energy to be sitting on the couch and really are looking to exercise. So um, in the buildings where we've had a, tr a tremendous amount of pushback, you know, we've said to the boards, you can definitely reopen, but within reason. And a lot of the same rules that would apply to the laundry room, for example, would, would apply here. Um, you know, you may want to have a sign up sheet to limit the number of people in the gym at any one time. Um, you can also flag machines so that every other machine is used to prevent people from working out too close to one another. It also depends on the size of your gym. You know, if it's a very small gym, you may want to limit it to one family at a time on a sign up sheet. If it's a much larger gym, then you could just stagger the machines that are able to be used and not have a sign-up sheet, just let people observe the um, natural social distancing. Um, one thing that we're recommending, regardless of the size of the gym, is that anybody who wants to work out, bring their own towel and cover all of the mats that they're sitting on or any of the benches. Um, this will help when you're sweating to prevent your sweat from staying on the, on the mat. Um, also to use that to wipe down the machines when you're done or to use a disinfecting wipe so that the next person isn't coming into contact with your sweat. Yeah. And wearing the mask there especially is very important because if you're running for 20 minutes on the treadmill, I mean, I, I can't do that, but I've heard that people do that. And <laughs> they people, you know, people, you know, work out. I, I've heard of a few people. Yeah. I, I don't believe it, but yeah. So they, <laughs> they said that. Uh, you can expel a lot, you know, if you're breathing heavy, it's, you know, and it could go further than the six feet. So it's really super important because then it could get on the equipment, it could get in the air, all the particles. So I've been listening to a lot of Sanjay Gupta. So I feel like, um, I feel <laughs> like I know what I'm You basically have a medical about. degree. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Levine, MD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not an MD, just for clarification. Um, okay. So anybody that enters, you think that they should sign a, a liability form, like a waiver form? So in in uh, the policies and procedures that are circulated, we included um, a Janeiro and certification. Um, uh oh, I think I think your Wi-Fi was popping out. Who doesn't feel well or whoops? I think you're. Where'd you lose me? Do you think, well, let me ask you again. Do you think, we'll just restart that question, but do you think that having that waiver in place is a good idea? Um, the problem with the waiver uh, is that somebody has to be monitoring it. And that means that a specific staff member or the managing agent has to be devoted to doing this. And, um, you know, part of the purpose of the waiver is the ability to deny entry to somebody who isn't feeling well. Um, but then again, somebody has to monitor that. So right. it's a little problematic in that sense. Um, but the nice part about this um, questionnaire and certification is that uh, there would be an indemnification and a, a waiver, a general release for any um, shareholder or unit owner that wants to use the gym. Um, they're releasing the board from any liability. Um, and will that hold up? Know, based on what's... Um, you know, waivers are interesting because they're limited in the scope that you're allowed to release somebody for liability. Um, yeah. But to some extent, it will. Um, I think. Uh, uh, we, we're having Wi Fi issues. Julie Schechter sitting outside. 
I'm going to throw this video up on YouTube so people could see that she's outside in, in the forest, but it's not helping on her. The right to prevent them. From oh, there you are. Kids. We lost you again. Uh oh. Hold on. I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause. Nobody will notice at home, but I'm going to pause. All right. So there was a quick pause. Hopefully our, our Wi-Fi issues there. People at home wouldn't have heard any of that. Um, if we move off of the gym, so we, we know that there could be a, a waiver of liability, but then you turn into a police state and then you're, somebody has to watch the store. So use that at your own you know, discretion. Right. Um, one of the important things that I'm really seeing a lot of is this, uh, the essential, the non-essential work that can start again on June 8th. And that's really the benchmark on Monday, June 8th. Today is June 4th. Um, so we're just a few days away from shareholders and unit owners being able to do work in their apartment legally. And now we're seeing this big influx of um, applications come in for alterations. And even if you can, I would say that the building or the building management should really take the position of spreading out the alterations, not let everybody do it at once because you're going to run into a lot of crowding. You're going to learn in, uh, run into a lot of resources of the building being used. And not only just the elevators. Especially and, the elevators. Yeah. yeah. Especially but it's all, the elevators, but not only the elevators. Right. It's um, one of the, the bad things is now we'll have our staff running around trying to disinfect everybody, you know, or behind everybody. And we have to keep track of multiple apartments. Um, one of the things that we've actually been sending out to the contractors is the, um, the New York Forward Safety Plan, where it's a, basically a document that says how they plan on enforcing social distancing while they work and making sure that um, they have all of their ducks in a row with that. I could put a link in the um, podcast uh, description of that document as a PDF so that you could see. And for those listening also, um, the worksheet that uh, or the memo that you guys worked up at Armstrong Teasdale, I'm also going to put as a, a link to download as well as the PDF. Um, so beyond the awesome. restriction, you're welcome. Beyond the restriction of scheduling and making sure that we're doing everything safely, what else do you recommend that we put into place with the alterations just to make sure that we're operating with our best foot forward and as safely as possible? Um, to the extent possible, we want to limit the traffic into and out of the apartment. Um, and so one suggestion that we've made to some of our boards is to have uh, the workmen who are performing the construction enter the building at one time, um, leave at another, and not leave at other points during the day. So don't leave for smoking breaks. They should be bringing their lunches um, and not leaving to bring in materials to the extent possible, bring in all the materials in the morning. Um, and bring out all the garbage at the end of the day or perhaps every couple of days to limit the use of the elevator. Um, definitely they should be using, all of the workers um, should be using the service elevator, um, which is a good rule in general, um, but just wanna reiterate it at this time. Um, it's important also, uh, a lot of projects were stopped um, when COVID, uh, started. And so there are a lot of projects where um, timelines had been submitted to the board for completion and for hitting milestones um, before the project starts again. Uh, the shareholder or unit owner should review with management, you know, provide an updated timeline. A lot of alteration agreements, um, you know, will include provisions for how long you can work on an alteration. Some right. of them have um, liquidated Penalties. damages yeah. clauses, mean, right? similar to a penalty for any work that goes beyond the anticipated timeline. You know, it's only fair to suspend those um, because there was this long period of time where the construction couldn't take place. But it's in addition to suspending um, the liquidated damages, it's important to get on the same page about what the updated timeline is um, and to make sure it's in, within the scope of the realm of what was agreed to in the original alteration agreement. Um, the other thing is everybody's still at home. Um, all non-essential workers still haven't returned to the office yet. And so it's important to be conscious of the people who are at home because if you allow alterations to start again and everybody starts doing noisy work, you know, in a standard alteration agreement, we typically limit noisy work to somewhere between nine and five, sometimes it's 
before, but the intent is to try to do it in a way that will inconvenience the least amount of people, do it when people are at work. Um, but in this case, nobody's at work. So yeah. it's important to just be conscious of the fact that if you're doing noisy work in your apartment, uh, that your neighbors are likely to all be home and to be disturbed by your noisy work. So to the extent that the noisy work can be done in a part of the unit that would not affect as many people or can be limited to a certain number of hours per day, uh, board should really speak to um, the shareholder or unit owner who's performing the renovation and try to put some sort of limitations on that because otherwise the board is going to receive you know, a million complaints from the neighbors of the um, apartment that's doing the alteration who are angry because they can't work from home because uh, yeah. they feel like there's a jackhammer going through their brain. So, yeah. And we have a lot of Google groups set up for one way out communication with our residents. So I think a good idea would be beyond just also sending a memo, just sending an email, hey, work, you know, work's happening in apartment 50. Uh, it's anticipated to last this long. These are the rules for the hours. Um, this is when it's going to hopefully finish. And this way people have information and won't be, they'll be upset. But if we could take away some of that anger, you know, and shock and surprise, I think that would, you know, it's all about how you communicate a lot of these things with people. So if we could, That's right. really, yeah, if we could communicate well and often, I think that we could do a lot to, to quell any, you know, disruption. Um, that's right. And again, um, workers are still subject to the same rules in common areas of the building. They have to wear face masks um, and they should be encouraged to socially distance, to observe the elevator rules. Um, they should, you know, not go in if there are any residents in the elevator. And when they're waiting for other workers, they should wait in the street and not in the lobby. Um, I think all these good, I think all these rules are good. And I think that they should be put into every uh, alteration agreement as a rider and, you know, just that's have exactly them, right. Have them sign um, that's, that's what we've been suggesting. Just tack it on as a, a COVID rider. Um, and it's important to have the shareholder or the unit owner who's performing the renovation, um, you know, consent to these additional terms in the rider. But, um, you know, it's, it's important to allow um, instead of preventing the alteration altogether, which is really not in anybody's best interest, because if you have a half finished apartment, um, often the resident can't live there. Um, and it's, it's not helpful to have a vacant apartment that's half completed. Um, so it's definitely in the building's best interest to allow the alteration to be completed, but to do it in a way that's safe for everybody and minimizes the annoyance to to the extent possible to all of the other people in the building. All right, so we've covered a lot and we still have a little bit more to go. So with the move in, move out policies, we have this, we also have um, walkthroughs for apartments that are about to sell. I have some boards that are loosening up the restrictions now on the walkthroughs. You know, it's typically just the buyers and maybe the agent going through, making sure that all of their checkoff items are taken care of before closing happens. But in the sense of a move in, move out, we have a lot more people in the apartment. There's a lot of large furniture. You need a lot of big people to move those heavy things. So what is your recommendation on how we should be handling the move in, move out policy right now? Um, well, again, there were people who were in all phases of um, like, like renovating. There were people who were in all phases of selling and completing their purchase of apartments when all of this happened. And so it's important for the health of the building to allow um, the transactions that were already underway and those that are um, scheduled to take place soon to actually take place. Um, you definitely, boards can limit um, the times when moves can take place and the number of movers who are allowed in the building at any time. Um, one suggestion that we made was to have no more than three movers in the building at any time. Um, we think that that should be enough. Um, and if it's easier, they can have certain workers who load and unload the truck and only uh, three movers who are in and out of the building. Um, it's a good idea to have the movers use only the service elevator and to let the um, other residents in the building know that the move is going to be taking place at that time so that they can choose whether or not to use the service elevator. 
if there's no service elevator, like in some buildings, you, you still want to let the residents know, um, but remind movers in either case that they shouldn't be getting into um, the elevator while there's anybody else in the elevator. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this during alterations, but um, the building has the right to deny access to anybody that they perceive to be sick or anybody if they're taking temperatures, anybody who has a temperature above the CDC guidelines. Um, that applies for contractors working in a unit and it also applies for movers who are uh, moving furniture in and, in and out of a unit. So if um, the doorman or the resident manager or the super asks any of the movers, if they're not feeling well and somebody were to respond yes, or there are a number of other questions, have you been in contact with somebody who is COVID positive? Um, do you have a fever? Um, if for any of those answers you receive a yes, um, the board would be within their rights to not allow that person into the building. And again, just like anybody who enters the building, the movers should all be wearing face masks and their access could be denied if they don't have a face mask. Um, in addition to the face masks, I know uh, Mark and I discussed that it may be controversial to wear gloves, but um, many of the movers that we've seen have been wearing gloves and other protection. Um, we've also heard of some buildings installing temporary tunnels, Mark. I don't know if you've heard about this, but I haven't, no. <laughs> it's, it's some, some crazy invention that one of the moving companies in New York has created where they put um, I think it's like an inflatable, it's some sort of plastic um, tunnel that lines the hallway um, where the move is taking place and access out the exit. Um, and that's to limit the contact. You know, it seems like overkill to me, but um, some buildings, you know, had required that and wanted to see it. Um, the other thing is buildings may want to require the, move, the moving party to pay for a disinfecting um, after the move, um, yeah. and the disinfecting would include the hallway that they, the apartment is in and, uh, perhaps the elevator and then from the elevator to the exterior of the building. Um, some buildings are taking additional security deposits for this. Other buildings are simply, um, having the staff do it, but I think the board is within its rights to charge a little bit extra for the disinfecting and bill, bill that back to the moving party or deduct it from uh, a security deposit that they're already holding if they have the right to do so uh, under- I agree. Under it, you know, an individual unit is causing another expense. So I would advise the board, no problem. As long as you're not being gross about it and you're covering just the cost and maybe a little bit of the inconvenience and time. Right. Right. To be clear, this isn't a way for buildings to profit off of people moving no. in and out of the building. This is really intended to only cover the administrative expense of the disinfecting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, anything, any um, fee that the building um, implements, they have to be careful that it's reasonable and related to the administrative expense or else um, it could be overturned by a court. Right. Because then it would just be arbitrary and not enforcing. right. Then it would be arbitrary and not related and used as a way of the build for the building to raise money, which is totally not the purpose of this type of fee. Not only am I a, uh, an MD, but I am also an attorney. Did you know that? <laughs> a jack yeah. of all trades. <laughs> Master of none. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> um. All right. So what else are we missing? I think we got everything. Did we? I think so. We did, we did construction. We did move-ins. We did amenities. We did gyms. We did laundry rooms. We did alterations, which I may have said before. We did essential construction, non-essential construction. We're starting up a lot of um, facade work again. You know, June eighth is like if you were unsafe, that's different. But for the buildings that maybe were you know safe or safe with the repair and maintenance on the local eleven facade stuff, then you know we could charge. We could start doing that again. Um, but uh, one thing that we're not starting to do again is in-person meetings. I've had so many, over, uh, last night I had an open meeting with a building in Brooklyn. We had 40 shareholders that joined us on the Zoom call and it went. Oh, wow. Well. That's a great turnout. Yeah. So I think we're going to do a whole episode of this just based on like proper procedures and what, like, how can you make it a little bit easier? I've kind of had a few 
annual meetings and open meetings under my belt now. So I feel, and I, as the host, so of them, I feel like I, I'm a, I'm a good expert on it. I feel like, you know, being the host of the meeting is a lot different than being somebody that's just attending the meeting. So I have a lot of the capabilities to mute people and, um, you know, ask questions and moderate and, you know, rename people. I think that. Wow. Like, that's a lot of power for one. A person. lot of power. I'm letting it get to my Don't head. Don't let it go to your head. Now I'm an authorita- authoritative, author- <laughs> Authoritarian, authora, yeah, me and Trump. Bet. Yeah, don't listen if you don't want that. You said I well, said. Well, I think our firm is going to circulate something uh, next week about virtual meetings because we've been getting just an influx of questions about whether to do them, whether to postpone. You know, our initial advice for the most part was just to postpone the annual meetings, but that was when we thought this whole COVID thing would blow over in a month. And now yeah. that it's looking like it's not going to blow over so quickly, you know, we're looking into the best procedures for holding a virtual meeting. So yeah. we'll I get back my, to you on that. Yeah. And my one big point of doing that would be just do a, an open meeting before an annual meeting because people will at least get a trial run when there's no vote or no quorum and no, nothing on the line, you know, to redo it again, but just trying it the first time we'll get at a lot of the kinks, you know, even if it's just a, Hey, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. For us, it was a new building. Um, that it was a first open meeting for us. So it was a way for the shareholders to meet me and the property manager that we assigned and go over the list of items. But, and it's also a way for the, the shareholders have not seen most of their neighbors in the last three months, you know, so having a forum where that you could provide that they could, talk, you know, on their own to somebody else on the, on the Zoom, you know, privately, or they could talk to everybody um, in the chat, or they can, you know, raise their hand and we can unmute them and they can, you know, talk to us and the board. I think that it's a great idea to maybe make yourself feel a little bit more in the community now. So Yeah, well, that's well, a great idea. I think everybody's to some degree feeling a little isolated right now. So I think it's a great idea to just yeah. Give people a forum for human contact of any kind. I know. It's tough. Why do you think I have a podcast? <laughs> when I'm not recording, I just speak to myself all day. It's really boring. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, but you probably agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, um, how could people get in touch with you? Give me your email and your phone number. Okay. So, if you want to shoot me an email, feel free to do so. My email is J Schechter, which is S C H E C H. T E R at A T as in Armstrong Teasdale, LLP.com. Um, or you can try my office number, which forwards to my cell phone, which is 212 209 4406. And again, if you want to uh, contact the podcast, uh, NYC Real Estate Podcast at gmail.com. My corporate email, uh, my company for EBMG is mblevine at ebmg.com. And if you want to call me, 212-335-2723, extension 201. And that goes directly to my cell phone. So I'm always there. But Julie, thank you for coming on. Um, Mark, this is awesome. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great episode. I'm sure we'll see you again. Okay, I hope so. Stay safe. See ya.